and, and thank you so much for inviting me today um, to come and speak to you about the, the Network Data Lab and the findings um, on children and young people's mental health that we published earlier this year. Just for a little bit of context, um, we're hosted and funded by the Health Foundation. The Health Foundation is an independent charity and our mission is to improve health and care for people in the UK. Um, so the, the Network Data Lab, and it's already mentioned a little bit in the introduction, is essentially a network of analytical partnerships across the UK. Uh, we have five local sites that we work with across England, Scotland and Wales. That's Northwest London, um, Public Health Wales, Leeds, uh, Cheshire and Merseyside and Grampian in Scotland. And together um, we work on shared problems in uh, across health and care and we use linked data sets that exist in these local areas to uh, um, run what, what we call a federated analysis model. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we also support these local systems to bring in uh, and integrate new data sources into their local safe havens and their local data models and to embed, uh, embed uh, patient and public involvement and engagement throughout the project life cycle. We use um, a federated analysis model. Um, and what that means is that uh, sensitive patient data never leaves the local system, so nothing is, is transferred to us. All the record level analysis is done within the local partner teams, and we only bring together aggregate and summary statistics. Um, and um, our aim is uh, to produce policy relevant insights that can um, both uh, influence national policy uh, as well as local decisions in the areas that we're working with. We have a, a few secondary aims as well that includes strengthening these local cross-sector partnerships that we're working with to make it easier for them to share data and, and work together. Um, and really what we'd like to see as a result of this is a, is a sustained local demand for analysis and a willingness to invest into analytics and, and data. Um, and we do that by, by demonstrating the value of this linked data and, and analysis, both, both to our local audience and to our national stakeholders. Uh, the way we work together is uh, there's very much an emphasis on collaboration. We uh, we work openly. We share all our code and our methodology um, online publicly, um, and we um, try to really embed reproducibility in, in, in across all sort of the, the code and statistical models that we use to analyze the data. Uh, Data access, as I already mentioned, is only happening at the local level and only some rest statistics are brought together centrally. Um, one of the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve through that is to build analytical capability in the, in the local teams that we work with, um, as well as new linked data sets that will have a value beyond the projects that we work on together. We um, spend a lot of time quality assuring both uh, the code that we use, um, the statistical outputs we produce, um, the, the reports um, sort of are internally peer reviewed, and we also um, have um, really great patient and public reviewers who help us uh, make our outputs even better. Um, we, within the network, um, we put a lot of share learning. Um, so we come together quite frequently um, and we communicate through Slack um, and sort of one to one meetings as well. Um, and as I already said, patient and public engagement is embedded um, throughout the life cycle, starting from when we choose and develop topics that we want to work on together, um, all the way to publication and beyond. And um, one of my colleagues has previously written about um, our approach to PPA. Um, and if that's of interest, um, you can um, still find this blog online. Um, the, the open ways of working that I already mentioned. So the main way in which we share our approaches and our code and our code lists and anything else that may be of use to other researchers way, way of working with similar data, it's all on our GitHub profile, um, nicely uh, documented, actually really easy to navigate, um, even if you're not familiar with our work. So this initiative was started back in 2019 where we started to recruit the partner sites that we were going to work with. And since then, we've uh, worked uh, uh, we, we worked towards an, an annual project cycle. Um, obviously, you, you all know what happened in 2019, 2020. Um, and um, 
this is why one of the, the first topic that we worked on together was the impact of shielding on the clinically extremely vulnerable public, uh, population. And you can see some of the outputs that were published uh, based on that here on the slides. The second uh, topic was on children and young people's mental health, and that's what I'm going to uh, spend most of the rest of today's presentation um, about. Um, we've now moved on to our third topic and we'll then look to uh, improve and redesign the way we work slightly for the next phase starting next year. Okay, and now to, uh, we'll, to the sort of meat of the presentation, which is our recent work on children and young people's mental health. Um, you are probably all aware that the, the prevalence of uh, mental health conditions among children and young people has been on the rise. Um, over the last two decades or so, showing um, some data on, on the slide here from some of the big uh, nationally representative surveys showing that um, even if you only look at the last three years, it's, it's pretty clear that the, the prevalence is going up. Um, and this challenge has been recognised by governments, governments across the UK. Um, and as, as part of this work, we reviewed um, with the help of our policy colleagues, reviewed um, all sort of recent policy documents in, all, in these three nations. And um, what we found is that really most of the, the, the overarching aims are shared, um, and that is to improve the provision of mental health and wellbeing support in schools and in the community outside of the NHS, with um, especially a focus on prevention. Um, all three nations want to improve access to specialist mental health care for children, um, also known as CAMS, uh, to improve uh, timely crisis care, um, and to extend mental health services for children beyond the age of 80, towards uh, 25 or 26 in Scotland, to avoid uh, this cliff edge that is currently that currently exists, where um, children and young people have to transition from children's to adult services at a time that is otherwise also quite turbulent. Um, however, despite this recognition and an ambition to improve access to services, um, as shown here, um, stated in the long-term plan uh, 2019, overall, the access to specialist mental health services remains quite low. Um, on the chart, showing here on the chart is, is just an extrapolation of the likely number of young children and young people with a probable mental health disorder in England and the fraction of those who are in touch with CAMS, um, which really hasn't uh, improved very much over the last few years. Um, of course, not all children and young people with a mental health condition will need NHS services um, and the sort of the expansion of, of support should also um, include mental health support in schools and in the community. Um, but what, our starting point for this work really was that we do not currently know enough about who receives mental health support, including both the NHS services available and, and wider support, and who may be missing out, um, and how that might have changed over time. Um, as we're working with um, local partners in the Network Data Lab, um, our analysis, uh, the, the approach that we took to this topic was of course informed by uh, the priorities uh, of our local stakeholders as well. Um, and one key limitation is that the data sets we work with are local. Um, so the findings may not necessarily be nationally representative, but we think that they, raise some important questions that are probably relevant to other areas as well. And I'm going to uh, just talk through three of these in the coming slides. The first one was, um, and this is this is data from our partners in, in Northwest London, was that we found um, an increase in the use of uh, general practice and uh, mental health prescribing um, by children and young people with a, a, a mental health diagnosis code. Um, over the last um, six years, and, and that's what's shown here on the slide. So in red, I'm just showing um, children and young people with a mental health-related GP event, um, and on blue, on top of those, um, are the, um, the ones who also have a mental health-related GP prescription. Um, this 
the, our local partners. So based based on these findings, our local partners are now exploring whether this may be a symptom of overstretched specialist services um, and whether it actually contributes to the pressures on in general practice that, that already exist. The second theme that we found um, and that, that popped up several times across our partner sides was uh, the mental health of adolescent girls and young women. Um, and I'm showing um, data from two partners here, um, Gramkin and Aberdeen on the left, and Cheshire and Merseyside on the right. And they looked at um, referrals to specialist services and um, young people in contact with um, specialist mental health services. Um, and you'll see um, that the patterns across these two analyses are really similar. And we find this big bump um, that around sort of the, um, where um, adolescent girls and young women um, show up on the graph in the middle. Um, and we found really that this age group is consistently overrepresented for young children and young people um, referred to services, seen by services, or among young people who present with a mental health crisis. However, um, we, this is all based on service use data. So who we're seeing here are only the young people who um, sought help and who successfully gained access. So it's equally important to think about who we're not seeing in this data. Um, and something that I'll come back to slightly later is that, is that our partners in Rampkin, for example, found some pretty compelling evidence that young boys were missing out um, on referrals to specialist mental health care. So what this data does not enable us to do is get a grip on which group may have um, the highest levels of unmet need. Um, the third theme that emerged from this work was the, the pretty stark socioeconomic inequalities that we found um, in almost every aspect of the data. Um, this, this graph shown on the slide here is work from our partners in Wales. We found that um, there was a, a really clear socioeconomic gradient in the rate that um, young people presented with mental health crises, either to ambulance services um, at a &E or um, in emergency admissions. Um, and but this pa this pattern was also present in um, when we looked at who is in touch with services, um, the frequency of mental health prescriptions um, among young people, um, and and other metrics. These um, these analyses have some limitations, as I already touched on. Um, there will. Uh, not all of them will be gen generalizable across the local areas uh, where they were produced. Um, there's very limited data available on services outside the NHS. Um, and often these services represent quite a significant part of mental health support provided to children and young people, whether that would be in schools, um, uh, services funded by local government, the voluntary sector um, and others. We also do not have any data on privately funded mental health care. Um, and as the pressures on NHS care are rising, this may or may not um, represent sort of an increasing proportion of care that young people would receive. Um, and as I've mentioned before, this data really only captured the young people who uh, sought and gained access to treatment and not the ones who didn't. Um, we also often lack um, detailed clinical information, so we don't know how severe the conditions were whether that changed over time, um, and, and importantly, what the outcome of receiving support was. Um, so the recommendations that I'm going to, to show you on the next slide really relate much more to our experiences of doing this work rather than, than the findings themselves. Um, we think that a, a more regular uh, collection of a robust and particularly more granular prevalence data in the form of national surveys would help local ser services to set realistic targets how much they need to spend because it would give them a better idea of the level of need within their area. We also need um, much more, much more needs to be done to improve the data quality of national men NHS mental health uh, services data. Um, in particular, uh, some of the prote protected characteristics are, are very poorly recorded at the moment. Um, and for example, we 
were planning to do some analysis on ethnicity and it was just, just not feasible with the data quality as it stands. Um, and we also need data coverage for mental health support that is provided outside of the NHS to better understand um, uh, whether children who uh, don't, success, don't gain access to, for example, CAMS are then picked up by other services as well. Um, and finally, um, linked data sources um, and data sharing across sector and organizational boundaries needs to improve um, so that to, to give local service planners and decision makers the insights they need to improve services. Um, and everything I've just spoken about is uh, can also be found in the briefing that we published um, this summer. And uh, our director, Charles, also um, published an excellent Twitter thread with it sort of uh, some, some of the key takeaways. So in, in this last part of um, my presentation, I wanted to um, talk about, so to give you some examples um, about what linked data, better linked data means at the local level, because I keep going on about, oh, we need better linked data, but what um, I think is probably helpful to, um, uh, to give you some examples of, on, on what the impact really can be when uh, when data quality and data linkage is improved. And so I'm, I've picked three examples from our partners, which hopefully illustrate that quite nicely. The first one is uh, work done by our partners in Wales who uh, created a novel linkage of data from the Welsh Ambulance Services Trust to routine healthcare data. Um, and they then look at mental health crisis presentations for children and young people, I think across two years in, in all of Wales. Um, and what you see on this slide here is a, is a Sankey chart that shows you how many of these mental health crisis call outs resulted in a transfer to A&E and, uh, and how many of these then um, uh, resulted in admission to hospital. And I think the first really striking takeaway for us from this data was that if you were only going to look at routine hospital data such as HES or SAS, you would, you would miss um, a significant proportion of mental health crisis events that just never made it to hospital. Um, and the second important finding, which I think um, really resonated with their local stakeholders was just the sheer volume of mental health related crisis, uh, mental health crisis related ambulance call outs for children and young people um, and the need to, um, to look more closely into this proportion of um, young people who, for example, refuse care. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, our, our partners in, in Wales are still work, working very closely with the uh, Welsh Ambulance Trust to, to see what could be done to um, improve the handling of these um, mental health crisis related calls from young people. And I think they are in the process of recruiting um, mental health practitioners who have experience um, with, with young people. And, uh, so that's an example about sort of data linkage that wants to be achieved. Um, my second example is really about data quality. And I already touched on this difficult topic of uh, transition to adult mental health services. Um, our partners in Leeds were really keen um, to understand the risk factors associated with um, whether or not children transition successfully from children's services to adult services. And this transition typically happens around ages 17 to 21, but it varies between local area and there's just not um, the, the type of team that people are seeing is not recorded consistently enough in the data to really pinpoint in this transition and quantify how many um, transitioned successfully. So what our partners did instead is that they used a proxy, um, which I'm showing here on the slide in, in the shape of a graph, which is that they, they quantified how many people are still in touch with services one year after their first um, contact. Um, and they did see a drop in the percentage around ages 17 to 21. Um, but what we don't know if that is related to the transition from children to adult services, or it has to do with um, the typical length of treatment pathways and whether young adults just have shorter treatment length in general. Um, 
And um, the nice thing was that our partners really didn't stop there. They uh, they engaged with local uh, mental health providers directly to better understand the root causes, explaining why some of these um, data items are so, are so under-recorded, in addition to some of the protective characteristics that I already touched on. Um, and they found some pretty interesting things. For example, um, that practitioners may be uh, reluctant to record mental health diagnosis for children because they're concerned about, about the associated stigma. Um, they also heard from providers that um, ca young carer status often goes unrecorded because um, young people are reluctant to um, declare their status. Um, that information flow between different services still isn't as linked up as it could be. And for example, information on whether children are looked after or have a protection plan isn't always recorded at referral to mental health services because it, it may not be directly relevant to their care. Um, and finally, they found that a lot of the really important information is recorded in free text, and that does not make it into these national data collections that we would do this type of analysis. Um, so really, there's much more work to be done um, at, at the local level with providers to, um, to improve data quality and to hopefully one day be able to um, get a better idea about which factors are associated, for example, with the, with the successful transition from children to adult services. And um, my final example is about, I guess, it's not directly data linkage, but it is about joining the dots between different data sets and putting them into context and drawing conclusions about what may be happening. Um, and really, that, so that's work by our partners in Grampian. Um, and their analysis is uh, just really striking because it's, it, it, it's quite simple, but it resulted in um, the local stakeholders learning something about, I think, the service that they previously weren't aware of. Um, for a bit of context, they looked at, at referrals to CAMS, so specialist mental health services, uh, over a number of years um, and grouped the patients by age group. Um, and what they, the overall picture was that more and more young people were referred and there were, and, and pressures on services were rising. Um, and they also saw that um, adolescent girls accounted for most of this rise in referrals, which I guess is consistent with some of the data I showed you earlier in the presentation. Um, but was strike, what was striking was what I'm showing you here on the slide, which was that the number of referrals for very young children actually decreased. And at the same time, the rejection, so the percentage of these referrals that, that were rejected increased. So it's sort of counterintuitive. Um, what they found by engaging with the uh, clinical team directly was that this may have been um, due to the um, due to an increased focus on supporting the growing needs of children and young people with complex anxiety or depression. And this is more common in older children and in adolescents. So um, what they found was that they, based on this analysis was that they needed to improve the support for younger children who are more likely to present with conditions such as uh, conduct disorders, ADHD, hyperactivity disorders, um, or, or others. Um, and I think that has resulted in actually hiring two new um, consultants for that specific um, uh, set. That, so um, that's all I'm going to say about um, children and young people's mental health um, today. Um, we are now working on a, a related but slightly different topic uh, around identification and support for unpaid carers, um, where we're bringing together um, primary care and local authority data to understand how different parts of the system identify um, unpaid carers and importantly who's missing um, and to better understand the what the pathway uh, to su receiving support for, um, uh, looks like for unpaid carers, how long does it take, um, uh, how may that have changed over time and how do different areas compare. Um, but we're also thinking about our, our, our next topic the one after that, um, and it would be really nice to have a, a bit of a discussion with you about where you think um, an initiative like the Net Network Data Lab could really make a difference. 
Um, but before I do that, I have to um, really credit the people who did all the work. There's a huge number of uh, sites um, and individuals involved who came together um, to produce the analysis. Um, so thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. That's a great presentation. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I think other people do as well. 